All right, we're here with Justin Lofton. He's the three-time Mint 400 winner, competed in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series, finished 84 races, 29 top 10 finishes, and is currently competing in the Score International Best in the Desert Off-Road Racing Series. Uh, Justin, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, and uh, look forward to it. Like like what you guys are doing. I, I guess to start, uh, kind of tell us about how you got into racing. In the, you know the early days when you started how old were you and how you got into it yeah it's uh i mean everyone that's the most common question i get asked is how do you get into racing not how did i necessarily get into racing but how do you get into racing and you know it's for me it was a very um natural thing because my dad started racing about the year i was born if not a, the year before everyone kind of goes back and forth on their first race was an 85 or 86 but um, regardless. So that's what, um, I was born into on the side that he, uh, he wanted to do it as a hobby, but he did it very regularly all the way up and, you know, up until a couple of years ago. Um, he, you know, he was good for five or six races a year. And my deal was, um, it was going to be naturally something I wanted to do. I didn't, you know, the like kids these days have trophy cards and all this other stuff where when we were younger, there wasn't any of that. So it was, Hey, you have to wait until you have a driver's license. You're old enough to reach the pedals essentially. And, uh, I'm still very yeah. vertically challenged. So that's still a lot of <laughs> still a big problem for me, but, uh, <laughs> so I started racing BMX bikes. I still had, you know, the racing, I had the racing bug and, uh, I was racing mountain bikes and, uh, ended up getting hurt when I was 16 years old, had a, basically a career ending injury with a broken femur. And about that time, I started, got my, had my life. I, I feel like I remember this being in high school with yep. you and kind of, I think I remember you being on crutches. Yep. Gimp, yeah. Gimping around, always getting out early for lunch. Yeah. That was my, that was my ticket. If someone yeah, get exactly. me out for lunch so I can make it. But, uh, so at that <laughs> exactly. Point, uh, yeah. At that point I wanted, I, I had already told my parents I wanted to race. Um, Caleb Sandine was a huge go-kart racer, uh, at when we were growing up, but, you know, growing up in a family business, especially in the cattle business, uh, my dad just couldn't dedicate the time to go go-kart racing. So I went BMX racing because I can jump in a buddy's truck and get taken to the BMX track that day or that night. And uh, so I went that way. But when I broke my femur, it was, you know, OK, it's time to get Justin in a race car. And through, you know, the, the years leading up to that, we had met some people that um had you know raced all different kinds of things you know we've met people from australia racing with jimco met people from australia from canada and north america um people that raced other kinds of series and and so my very real first series was racing in the colorado hill climb series when i was 17 years old racing uh pikes peak style racing not only did that for a year as a very quick jumping you know like jump start, but my first race car was a 600 horsepower, 1300 pound car. So it was essentially it was a sprint car. Uh, yeah. Showed up my first race with a cane. I wasn't even really supposed to, by doctor's orders, even walk on my femur yet. But I got thrown in this race car and say, okay, here's a two and a half mile course up the side of a mountain in Grand Junction, Colorado. So I was uh, I was thrown the thrown to the wolves at a very young age, and things just pretty much progressed from there. Um, wasn't much of one to be a student, didn't like to sit down, didn't like to go to school, didn't like any of that. So I pretty much had to make the mind up, my mind up that I have to make this work. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm very, very fortunate that I grew up with a financial backing that I had, but at the same time, I still couldn't be a slouch in any way. And so we, um, you know, I had to, I had to perform. I had to do good. I had the same or more pressure than say a college student would. And things just kind of progressed from there. It's like, Hey, we did this kind of racing. What's the next step? Late models at Irwindale. I did that for a year, showed that I could not only, you know, perform there. I can, I can, I've exceeded what the expectations were. So what's the next step? And I went and then grand national racing, um, which is, west coast racing then i went arca regional racing or arca national racing which i won the championship in 2009 that just kind of pro 
propelled my uh, career all the way through the NASCAR ranks. And then I yeah. didn't get to drive a cup car. My biggest, biggest regret doing that. But, you know, I kind of just spent my time there and um, economy and, and obviously family reasons brought me home. And I'm now racing trophy trucks yeah. and on the Southwest. Yeah. Um, kind of take it back on that real quick. So you getting into i mean what would i mean obviously for the for the for the general public i mean how do you get into being you know racing nascar like racing the, the truck series or you know even getting into that world like i mean i don't think there's an application anywhere i don't think you're like i mean how do you actually like make that transition to getting into that kind of level it's uh it's time and performing and someone noticing you um because there's people even today, I still I'm very close with a, a, with some team owners out there, and and I look at, hey, this kid here is excelling. You need to go talk to him, or I need to go talk yeah. to him, or some way like that. And that's essentially what had happened with me was the guy who I was racing uh, the hill climb car for. His name uh, is Gay Smith out of Colorado, and he raced hill climb cars for thirty something years. But he was best friends with Jack Roush who owns Roush okay. Fenway Racing. Yeah. And he was like, hey, you're pretty good at this. Like, these are your steps that you need to take. And these are who you need to talk to. Yeah. And there's, it's just, I think, a, probably a lot like playing football and playing basketball. There's there's people sure. out there that you have no idea what their background is or what, you know, what they've done or who they know. And that's essentially what it was. Is I performed at one level or doing one aspect, you know, one aspect. And they're like, you need to think about doing this. And it led me all the way to North Carolina where I lived there for six years. Wow. Yeah. No, that, and that's, and that's probably, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I would, I would say with the advancement in like media and social media and all of that, I would think that's kind of opened that world up to maybe some people that are at a lower level, but you know, have, you know, some talent to really show more people out there and maybe kind of make that, that, that run up to those levels. Uh, for, yeah, definitely for sure. I mean, this was, I, I think we were still doing MySpace when I was racing. Exactly. Stock cars. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, this is a time where just started. Um, yeah. I remember, sitting in a, yeah. I remember sitting in a, in a NASCAR meeting, basically where uh, like a media meeting where they gathered all the drivers and media personnel for each one of the teams and introduced us to Twitter before we even knew what, yeah. you know, Twitter was public. They introduced us to Twitter and go, this is the platform that we want you guys to communicate on. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really, it was, it was really, really strange. And, uh, you know, the kids these days that are moving up have a chance to showcase their talent and show it to the world a lot easier than what my generation did. Definitely. Yeah. No, it's, it's, and I mean, even anything even farther back, you know, even the guys before, before, like, you know, your, your time, um, how these young kids are way more popular on these social media than even those, those guys, yeah. you know, with, with, uh, far less, um, accolades behind them, but yeah. you know, the platforms are built for, for that, that younger generation. And, uh, so yeah, then that, that, that definitely, uh, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I do recall, um, I want to say, I, I want to say I saw you outside of, I was like going to college in San Diego and working at Best Buy. And I want to say, I saw you there and you were, um, just, so I don't know, it was like 2006 or seven, but you must've been racing. What were you, what were you racing at that time? So I was racing the grand national series, um, NASCAR grand national series, which was a West coast, um, a primary West coast series. We ran Arizona, California, Oregon, and Washington, and in uh, one Utah race. So it was strictly West Coast um, series. And that was like my stepping stone between going regional racing and national racing yeah. just before I moved to North Carolina. Gotcha. Gotcha. Got you. So that, that was kind of that, that catapult to get into that, that next level was dominating that series. Yeah. And you know, what's really weird about that is I never even, I didn't even dominate that series, um, which was was really bad and it's something that's like the one thing I want to go back to is it's one in the series I never want to race in but what changed everything for me was there was one race where 
I started in, I started in the front, started on front row. Something happened. I got sent to the back. I drove back to the front. I got sent to the back, drove back to the front. And after the race, I got called to the trailer and you never want to get called to the trailer. Like it means you did something wrong. And I got uh, called to the trailer and go, Oh crap, here we go. You know, what, ha- what did I do? And, uh, and I drove and I was very aggressive, but I didn't, I never intentionally wrecked anyone, e- even unintentionally. Yeah. It never, it never happened. And the yeah. series director said, look, this is not for you. He said, you are, you are, you are better than anyone else around you and you need to move back East. And that's all, and that's all it took. And I never want to race oh, there. Wow. Never had, never had good results because every time I was going to have that result, I wanted um, I remember, I mean, the checkered flag was out and someone intentionally wrecked me in turn three or turn four. I mean, they were like, if, if I wasn't going to win the race, I was not going to let you win the race. And that happened to me more than once. Yeah. And so yeah. when we got that news, it was okay. We immediately started looking back East for a series to go yeah. race. And, and, um, and it was definitely a lot more fit, a better fit for me because it wasn't long before I was qualifying you know i was qualifying first and setting track records and won a race in like my first five races or something like that back there yeah so so so, so you were obviously were ready for that transition to to that next level it's like overclassed essentially yeah Yeah. than where i was so do you feel like the guys in that 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 arc series were were kind of just maybe out for you a little bit they just didn't want to see that's you were you were young and see you win Definitely. There was, there was definitely like a target on my back and, and I came in with a lot of support, um, you know, financially I came and then with, yeah. I was flying crew chiefs out from the East coast that were crew chief and cup cars at the time. I mean, cause that's the, the people I, I met that told me, Hey, this is, this is what you should try for a living. were helping me do that. And, uh, yeah. you know, it wasn't more than, I was trying to throw more money around than the next person was I had people behind me that wanted to see me succeed and excel in it. And, um, yeah, definitely. You know, I think there was definitely some, you know, probably some jealousy ish, you know, deal and, um, you know, it's part of it, but it's a learning curve. You gotta, you, you take every step of the way and you gotta learn from it. If you don't learn from it, it was a waste of time, but, um, you know, it wasn't yeah. so. So as someone that's not too familiar with the racing world, what, what is NASCAR as far as moving out East? What does that move like? Yeah. So moving out East, uh, it, it's the hub of, of stock car racing of it, really any kind of circle track racing. Um, way back in the, in the day, in the 1930s, the prohibition area era, all the moonshiners were hopping up 1932 Ford coupes and, uh, so all these guys had all these hopped up cars. And when Pro- Prohibition ended, there was all these cars running around. So uh, Bill France essentially put a race together down in Daytona Beach, on right on the beach, right on the water, and, uh, you know, had two corners in it. And that's where NASCAR was born. I mean, right on the beach with all these 1932 Ford Coupes running around, and the sport was born. And because the East Coast is so populated, there was tracks – every 15 20 miles um wow. then the nascar circuit back in the day actually consisted of multiple people just putting on races and you gather points for a national race so, or a national series and national points championship so there was you know back in the 50s 60s 70s 80s these guys could just hit a trap hit a race on wednesday night get some points race again Thursday night if they didn't wreck their car, race again Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and and, um, and then collectively put together a national point series championship. It eventually became a lot more sanctioned in NASCAR. Um, NASCAR was still at the time, but then they actually started putting on their own races. And so when everyone talks about going back east, it's because they're still, those tracks are still around. There's yeah. local series that are racing them. And so when you're trying to show that you belong there or you're trying to race against the best of the best, that's just, that's where you go because you can pick and go, Hey, you know, so-and-so is racing tonight at Bowman gray stadium. Let's go race there tonight. 
and yeah. you know and just works its way up so it um you know i guess it would be kind of going to play in you know one of the big collegiate ivy league teams you know or series like i yeah. want to play against the people that from day one knew they were going to go play here and are eventually going to find their way to the nfl so yeah it, it, and i assume that's kind of also a bit of a like a financial you know ideas because you, if you're if you're in the hub like you said you can hit all these races when you're yeah. you're based out of like the west coast you really can't do that yeah yeah our my closest oval track since Cajon speedway was torn down was at irwindale and that's a four-hour mm -hmm. drive from here um yeah. And then you're only racing against the people that are in the same loop. So the technology, the talent pool, everything is only so big where when you go back east, you have a you have a cup crew chief, Jeff Gordon's crew chief, Jimmy Johnson's crew chief, one of those guys that on Thursday night or for Wednesday night are helping, a, you know, a family friend's kid out at the yeah. racetrack. So the race car is naturally going to be faster just because of the you knowledge and experience that they have exactly yeah yeah um and, and i know we already we already hit on the truck series and, and how that was for you i mean and and i'm just curious and I, i'm assuming the answer is yes you, you did kind of allude to it um your goal at that time i, I assume was to make it to the pinnacle of nascar yeah right? yep. and and talk about that a little bit as i was that a goal of yours as a young kid i mean or since you get kind of said you didn't really race, but you, I mean, your family kind of grew up around it. Um, but once you got in a car with that was, I assumed the goal in goal. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, at a young age, formula one racing was like formula one racing, open wheel racing, any car racing was very popular when in the early nineties. So, you know, yeah. if I was going to be a race car driver, that's what I wanted to be. NASCAR sure. wasn't as mainstream as it, as it became. Um, and a lot of it, you know, was because of IndyCar carts, what they're split. But anyways, uh, pretty much at a young age, I wanted to be a NASCAR driver. I mean, there's a picture floating around from me in my grandpa's closet with NASCAR 1996 or 98 or whatever it was when the, basically the first simulator came out. So, uh, you know, at a, at a really young age, that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I actually realized that that was a you know, that was actually something achievable. And, um, you know, my, I would say my unfortunate biggest downfall was just economic timing. Yeah. If I was, if I had made the decision to move to the East coast two years earlier, I would probably be racing a cup car right now. Yeah. But I was, I was right behind. I was in the same I was one year behind. I was one class behind the Ricky Stenhouse juniors, the Justin Algars, those yeah. those guys that have cup rides i was one year behind them i beat them when i raced them but yeah. i was one year behind them and yeah. so i, I mean, caught up in the economic timing of things and and yeah. uh you know it's definitely a bummer but it's you know it's what is you know it's what's thrown to you so yeah and i think exactly. I've made, i think i've made the best of it um with my off-road career no, no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, I think we're all, we're all put through things like that, right. Where we're timing, uh, it, it may not be what you, what you hoped it was going to be at the time and what you thought was going to come from it, but, um, you never know what that opens up, you know, for you, uh, down the road. Um, so, so you kind of, you kind of mentioned that, um, you know, rolling into that, did you ever see yourself racing off-road? <laughs> I, uh, I raced off road once or twice a year when I was racing stock cars, when I lived back East, I'd come home and, and essentially it was a race. Hey, this is, um, our schedules are freed up. And my dad continued racing almost the entire time I was racing stock cars. So mm -hmm. off road racing was still a big part of my life. Just not what was, what we were trying to attain and achieve and excel in. So it was more of a, a fun thing that we did yeah. and, you know, it was, it was, it was there as a fun thing. Um, you know, when things started fading on the NASCAR side and, and I say things started fading, I got hired, uh, for a 10 race truck deal at the very end, I think it was 2015. And I actually got fired five races into it because I was the B truck and I wasn't yeah. supposed to be the A truck. So if I had finished 20th every week, cause he finished 17th, I probably would would have still been there, but I tried to win races. 
Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I, I ended up getting get fired halfway. You were through too the good show. to be the beef yeah, truck guy. Too, too good again, and uh, <laughs> I got, got fired halfway through. And at that point, I had, I was kind of over the whole thing. I was didn't see anything. I didn't see any golden light at the end of the tunnel down yeah. the road, whatever. And um, by then, my dad had basically made an offer that said if I come home, we get a, we'll build a trophy truck, we'll race trophy trucks and feed cattle. And, uh, yeah. little did you know, in 2015, you win the mint 400 and then you turn around and do it again in 2016, you get kind of big time sponsors. So, um, yeah, I'm more at professional race car driving than I am feeding cattle. Yeah. No. So, yeah. So, so you, so you guys moved back here and I remember, you know, um, you know, obviously you were, you were kind of working that trajectory up in the NASCAR, you know, in the truck series. And I mean, I, I, a lot of people knew, you know, what you were doing and who you were and in, in, in that world. Um, yeah. And then, and then you came home and, uh, and so like, uh, for those that don't know, uh, t- since you kind of, you kind of jumped into there, talk a little bit about your, I don't, I, I would say it's probably your, main job but i don't know i don't know how i don't know where they where they fall in line of each other but uh talk a little bit about the, the cattle world for yourself yeah. and what you guys do there yeah so we uh so it, it was supposed to be hey you get a race trophy truck four or five times a year and and uh come home and basically internship and and ride around with my dad um yeah. we had a, a mineral mixing plant and uh we actually took care of a Helena offloading facility and we did the maintenance work. We offloaded the rail cars and, and did the building. And so essentially for four or five hours in the morning, I would ride around with my dad and it was a complete, I mean, I never collected a paycheck from that. I mean, since I got to do a lot of other cool stuff, but that was my time, my time I put in the day. And then uh, at lunchtime, I got to go down and sweep the floors at the Helena plant or open rail cars or push rail cars around and, still get to do something cool, but that was actually when I got to clock in and, and get paid for the time. So, but the goal was always, um, to eventually take over a feed yard, manage a feed yard in which, yeah. uh, three years ago, four years ago, I got my opportunity to do that to our, for our yard in the panhandle of Texas, uh, which is Western cattle feeders. Um, both Wheeler and I, you know, you'll see us wearing hats and stuff like that, but that's our feed yard out there in the panhandle and um, did that basically took it over full time for three years, lived out there, lived in my motor home for six months of it while Lisa was pregnant. Um, I mean, pretty much missed out on the whole pregnancy thing, uh, which I don't know for some of you out there probably say that was definitely a blessing. <laughs> but uh, Yeah. So I, I, you know, did that went out there and our life was definitely going in that direction. And then Yokohama tire comes along and this was um, a year and a half ago and they liked what we were doing and we won races, we were competitive and, and we were doing everything they wanted to do. And they basically made me an offer that gave me the opportunity to then become a full-time race car driver again. Yeah. Um, so I, wouldn't say I resigned from my position, but I just, um, you know, I let, I talked to the family and I said, Hey, here's an opportunity that I get to live out my dream that I essentially, I didn't get to live in North Carolina, get a, you know, be a professional race car driver for a big company. And yeah, so I kind of shifted my focus back to off-road racing and they were, we were supposed to do a lot of other cool stuff. Then COVID hit. And it kind of put yeah. everyone in big stalemate. And um, I wasn't, you know, with what was going on, I, I'd already kind of redirected my focus to the off-road world. So I couldn't jump fully back into cattle feeding. Um, Hold on, Justin. Yeah. Hey. We have a visitor, Justin. Hey, you can join us. Say hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. Now. Okay, go tell Madden he's naughty and go inside and close the door, please. Okay, <laughs> bye. I'll see you later. Okay, go inside. Go inside. Close the door. Okay, go. Hurry up. Okay, I'm going to turn it off. You're going to have to go to bed. Go. Hurry. You better run. <laughs> yeah. 
so um so so covid uh run back to that part so so you uh you guys had a lot planned um and uh, and then covid kind of uh, interrupted obviously everyone's yeah. world and uh <laughs> so 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 where you know i mean I, I assume most of the races at that point were canceled and, and the plans were everything was uh, halted yeah it's uh it covid definitely we went from gonna race um march which we got our mint 400 in but then april may june july um all the way up to august we pretty much had races planned or of some kind whether it was off-road racing or yeah. uh Porsche cup racing or something else that yokohama had lined up for us and it all got i mean it basically all got canceled so yeah there was a lot of uh sitting around and um not that we ever really sit around too much there's always something to do with these trucks and Sure. We kind of took the opportunity to shift a lot of the focus onto our media side. And, uh, you know, Russell and I came up, um, Russell's my media guy, and he we came up with a lot of stuff that you're actually going to start seeing through this year. Uh, you know, a lot of it is brainstorming. And as you guys know, it takes a lot of time to get things off the ground. Perfect yeah. plan. It all looks good. It all should make sense. And then you either have equipment failure or, you know, whatever it is, or it just takes time to make things happen. So, um, but it was, it, we actually made the most of it. And a lot of the stuff that you'll see from my social media side actually was, came up through April, May, June. So, uh, Justin, kind of tell us more about your, uh, the, the odd beef life. Uh, the YouTube yeah, so videos you got going on. So going going into the Abi Life, which is my YouTube series, that the goal Russell had approached me, I don't know, two or three years before we ever even did it, and said, and he was a young kid. Um, shoot, it might have been twenty two or twenty three at the time. Said, I have this great idea, and I want you to do it. And and Russell and I's connection goes back, um not really directly through me, but through my younger sister, Gabby in the 4-H days. Mm -hmm. And so he was in the action sport side. He actually was one of the video, um, video guys on the, on set when Robbie Madison, was it Robbie Madison that rode the wave on the dirt bike? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So he was one of those guys wow. on that yeah. actually helping film it. So, he came to me, like I said, a couple of years before we started it and said, I want to do this. And I was like, no, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get into this. I don't want to do this. And, yeah. um, and then Liam was born and I said, okay, I agree to one year. And this is, this is all I have to pay you. This is our budget, yeah. but it's not necessarily going to be about racing. I want it to be when basically the first year, and that was the first year that my off-road schedule was going to get really, really busy. And I said, I want you to capture what dad did when dad was gone from home. You're basically yeah. capturing the first year of Liam's life. Yeah. And we got so much reception from it that you're going to continue it again next year. And then you're going to continue it again next year. And then yeah. you're going to continue it again next year. So here we are four years later. Um, yeah. but with, with the same, with the same mindset that I want to capture what went on in races essentially. So when we go back in time or when our, when we're old and crippled and can't do anything, yeah. we can show our grandkids like, look, this is what we used to do. But when they're yeah, all yeah. flying around in their, in their jets and cars or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's where it came from. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, and I think we've get we've gotten better at it. Um, we shifted focus just a little bit because now Liam's old enough to actually participate in them. So, yeah. um, big thing about mine is you know getting the interaction from everyone because there's I learned a lot stock car racing. So we build friendships that we'll never forget, and I really wish I can go back and see all the times that I spent with all my friends that I had back east, yeah. and so the kind of what my piece of it is is like hey guys this is something 20 years from now we're not doing this we're gonna enjoy going back and going look at what we used to got you know used to do and yeah. it's really i mean it's 
it is it's really really cool what we get to do and that we're fortunate enough to do it and um there's guys that you know make a living off of it i've got two full-time guys that work on my race trucks and one day they might not think it's cool today but one day they're going to look back and go man i really wish i was working on race cars again oh no yeah. doubt about it i think like especially with something that you know if you get the opportunity in your life to to have a job that is literally your passion as well like i mean it is what what, what drives you you know um that's that's a rare i think it's a rare thing generally for most people to right to have that i mean we have jobs we we, we enjoy but to, to be your true passion and that to be what pays your bills um it's a that, that's a rare thing to find uh yeah I, I think you kind of alluded to this in this song, but uh, I, what 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 is your motivation at, at this point in your career? What what drives you? What what makes you want to continue racing and, and uh, you know to, to keep doing what you're doing at the at the at a higher level? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of it is is it's a natural competitiveness in me. I mean, it's just it drives me, and I enjoy. I enjoy it now from going, I, I enjoy putting my helmet on. I enjoy putting my race gear on sitting behind the wheel. As you can tell now I'm sitting in my race seat that in my simulator at my house. Um, I just, I get to put it on and, and I get, I might, I guess you could say I might be a little bit of a showboat. Um, it lets <laughs> me express that side of it, but you know, ultimately now it's, it's putting together the best race team. We have a really, really, cool group of guys that we get a race against that our dads race against each other. Um, we're all friends, but you know, when you want to beat your friends, you're that much more competitive about it. Yeah. And they're very dedicated to it. They're, you know, financially, um, equipment wise, everything there. So it's putting the whole thing together. It's putting the perfect group of people together, putting the perfect race together. And, uh, you know, which is definitely what, drives me but at the same time um as anyone knows that has kids that's ultimately what keeps you going now um yeah i never would have lost interest in racing but i wouldn't have i wouldn't look at it the same now as i do that liam is watching me yeah and it's um it makes it really cool it makes it a lot of fun and i've i've won two races since liam was born and there's really really funny stories about it and I'm definitely going to post, I'm definitely going to send you a picture to put in, in your podcast for this. Yeah. But the second race was back just in October and my dad had taken the girls out to uh, sand Hill to watch us go somewhere, you know, area where we catch big air and we're going really yeah. fast, all that. Well, Lisa got her car stuck. Uh oh, on the sand hill. and well I, well, I don't know if it was Lisa or my dad, but anyways, Lisa's car got stuck <laughs> and the boys in it. And so we're going around to win the race and they're not there to be on the podium. And, uh, so I got a picture, I pulled out my phone and I got a picture and said, sorry, we'd be here, but here's my car. And, uh, <laughs> so it was, it was her car stuck on a stand deal. So, the other one was a mint 400 race that Liam wasn't, you know, Liam was barely a year old yeah. and, uh, you know, obviously didn't get to go to that race, but the most recent one. So that yeah. definitely what driving is, is getting it, you know, getting them up on the podium and, um, yeah. kind of enjoying it and seeing the, you know, seeing the passion and the fun. Yeah. And I, I think it's pretty cool. Like you said, I mean, you, you, you know, you as, as a racer, I mean, as long as you know, I think you, you have the right sponsors around you and, and the right team around you can you can, this is a sport you can continue to do for, you know, quite a bit longer, as long as your body can handle it. Right. And do all yeah. those things. So, um, which is really cool because, you know, you're, 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 you'll be able to let, you know, the, the kids grow up and see all this stuff around, you know, and, and they'll be able to, you know, as, as time goes on and, you know, for you or Wheeler, all you guys would get it. They'll be able to partake in the whole thing. And that's yep. a, a family sport at that point in time. And I think that's where it even probably even gets more fun for you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's something I think Rob Mack is in his mid fifties and he can still go out and whoop on, whoop on the young kids. And, yeah. and I remember I, I've been racing trophy trucks for six years now. And I was the young kid and there. Now there's kids even younger than me doing it. Well, I just turned 35. So, 
Um, you know, there, but there's kids that are 10 years younger than me racing trophy trucks now. Yeah. So I'm like one of the old guys, which seems kind of weird, but yeah, it's something we can, I, you know, I at least can do for another 20 years as long as, as long as my body holds up and, um, by no means is it, is it easy on your body, regardless of what the videos show, uh, you know, we get the crap absolutely beat out of us. And, and when we crash now, we crash hard. Uh, back in 2015, I crashed so hard. My eyeballs tried to come out of my head and literally Jeez. like was pushing them back in my head. So, oh, uh, wow. you know, you can only take a couple of those in your life before you say you gotta, you gotta hang That's it, hang enough. it out. But yeah. It's, and sp speaking of that, we're, I wanted to ask you, I, what, kind of two questions what what's the most grueling race you've been in and <laughs> also what kind of do you do any kind of preparation as far i know you're into you've done iron man triathlons like what kind of preparation goes into that kind of for physically and mentally and what's the most gruesome race you've been a part of yeah so the most i would say the most gruesome race is definitely the baja 1000 um you know even the last one i was in uh, we were in the car, we did five, 480 miles, but it was a very slow 480 miles. And for some reason I've chosen to do the night sections more than once. Ooh. So get in the car about nine o'clock at night and you go until, you know, noon the next day. And, uh, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely grueling, um, because you're not, you know, you, you have to stay on top of it. You have to, yeah. you know, have to be awake. You have to do that. Uh, a couple of years ago, we broke up on the side of a mountain and Derek and I actually spent the night literally on a, on a side of a mountain because the course was so narrow that we were able to get the truck halfway up on it and had to wait for parts to be brought in. There was ice on the ground. I mean, it was below freezing the entire time. Um, and we, and we slept there. Uh, luckily I, I learned out of all places. Stuff. Yeah, I had I used a fire starter because it was a time that that Naked and Afraid on Discovery Channel was really oh. big. I was like, I am not gonna let this beat me. I am gonna start a fire. Um, I did have a little bit of race gas on my side to help, but I still had to use a fire starter. Still had to collect all the wood around. Had to find the dry wood and the whole thing. And um, you know that by far was the most grueling because it was almost 18 hours since we had gotten in the truck. Yeah. And uh, until we finished. So, and we did finish, we got parked brought into us. We finished before the cutoff time. Um, so by far that was, you know, I'd say the most grueling part. Yeah. yeah. Should have been a break. We were running, I think fourth place on the road and um, should have been a breeze should have been easy, but it wasn't. Um, but as far as going, you know, on the physical side of it, uh, like you had mentioned, you know, I, I trained for or not, you know, half Ironman, I've done triathlons. I, I spend a lot of time on a bike. And a lot of it just comes down to conditioning your body for as long as you want to take a beating. Um, I do a lot of heart rate training. I wear my watch or a heart rate monitor during a race to see where my heart rate is. And then I train accordingly to that. So, um, you know, do everything you can that, you know, the faster you want to go, the better you want to feel at the end of the race, you know, the harder you'll train. And yeah, that is one thing I know, we've all stepped up from the the older class of trophy truck racers to the younger classes now we all on we're all on strava we all have garmin stuff so we all see like oh andy mcmillan went for a 32 mile bike ride climbed a thousand feet and did it in three hours well i'm gonna go do the same thing but i want to do it in two hours and 59 minutes so you're competing so, outside of the truck all year long it just never ends yeah yeah it never ends so it uh it keeps us all it keeps us all going and and uh, that's what and that's what makes it fun yeah i mean we sure. can all go and most a lot of us have kids the same age and they're all out cruising around together and yeah yeah it's such it's such crazy. a small world I, I would think right i mean with with you with with the guys that are involved in in this sport i mean it is uh it, it definitely was a small world. So it'd be, I would say it'd be hard to at least not be acquaintances, let alone, <laughs> I mean, probably friends. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. Definitely with the amount of testosterone that's rolling through a lot of that stuff, especially during <laughs> races, I can only imagine uh, yeah. what that's like. Uh, 
you know, that, that, that leads me to something else I was curious about for you. Is there any, in part, you know, in, in particular individual that you just love to race against this guy? Is there someone out there that, you know, um, it, it's fun to see them uh, in the same lineup as you? Yeah, there's, there's definitely one, uh, Jason Voss and I, and, and he, uh, unfortunately crashed really, really hard at blue water. And, uh, we were, I was actually, besides his brother-in-law, I was the only other racer race car driver that was actually invited to their wedding. So that's kind of how good of friends we are. Yeah. And he, and which is really funny is he's actually sponsored by the other shock company. Oh, um, really? So yeah. I'm, I'm Fox shocks. He's the King shock truck. Yeah. And, so oh, it's a it's a lot of fun. If I don't get a chance to win, I want to see him win, and and it goes um, back and forth. And it's and he's actually their side is so competitive that it's like even our wives and kids. He doesn't really want to see them like even commingling before, <laughs> like maybe after the race we can all hang out, but like before the race, like no, we're like competitors and we're racing. But it's the same, you know, it's the same thing after the race. Like, hey, I'm glad you won, or hey, good job. Yeah, and. You know, it's it's a bummer. Like I said, he crashed really, really hard in October, and uh, is gonna probably have to take this entire season off. So I'm definitely yeah. gonna miss racing him. But it, um, but he's one guy. You know, he's the one guy that's like, hey, I want to race and let's race hard, and um, and we'll race really hard. We put on, we'll put on a show, but we won't mess each other up. Yeah, it's like best man wins. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That is. Uh, what about, uh, what, what about the, the younger generation, right? Since, 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 uh, you, you say you're, you're kind of, uh, you were the young guy now, now you're not the youngest. Who, who, who do you see that's coming up that, that, that has potential to be really special? You know, there's, um, there's a kid, Jack's red line. He's I think 16 or 17 years old at, and he's out of Avernillo, Texas, out of all places, you know, 90 miles from where our yard is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's been very fortunate to get a race, a lot of things at a very young age. And, um, you know, he's got the financial backing to, to be racing in the premier class of trophy trucks. So just naturally he is going to have a lot of time on a lot of people. Um, it just, you know, anything it's, you know, naturally you get used to get used to playing against a, you know, a 300 pound guy, or you get yep. a, a race in a, 800 horsepower truck you're just naturally going to be faster just because of of experience so yeah he's going to be one that's going to be really tough to beat um you know in a couple of years and you know even for us because he's not far behind how many years i have in a truck yeah yeah that's uh that's crazy yeah being that that young and doing it uh um, yeah what uh what is this year? And I don't know if you guys talked about this when I was gone, but what, what is the rest of this year? So right now we're, uh, we're late February, 2021. What, what does this year look like? It holds for you as far as, um, in, in the, you know, in your goals and what do you have lined up and, and, and what is your, uh, yeah, what, what do you, what do you, what is, what's the, what's the ideal year look for, look like for you? Yeah. So this year is, is actually looked a lot different than years past. Um, there's already been two major races in the Best in Desert Series and then a one-off race for the King of the Hammer Series. But we decided to miss those and concentrate on the score series and race the Baja races. Uh, so we've taken that time and we've actually made two trips down to Baja already. And we're actually leaving in the morning for our third trip down there. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is what in a lot of people I think don't take for granted in racing is there's there's a lot of pieces of equipment to get ready. There's a lot of people uh, that you need to have on the same page because when you leave for a race in the morning, you're going to send three or four or five different crews. And every one of those crews has to not only have the equipment to service the truck, but then you have to have the personnel that has the knowledge and is on the same page as you to do that because there is no, you don't have cell phone service. You don't have, um, you know, we have satellite phone service, but, you know, everyone knows how good that works. A little spot. It works. It works. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we've taken that time and we're concentrating and getting every and getting more our crew guys comfortable just crossing the border, um, getting to know where access roads are. It's in a different country with people that speak yeah. a completely different language. Yeah. And so um, our year looks, our year we're focusing on Mexico and winning 
you know, a Mexico race for Yokohama, for Fox and Method and, and ourselves for what we've put into it. And um, so we look like five races versus nine races that I did last year yeah. and just a lot more focus and attention on on those races. Yeah. Now, that's exciting. Um, and I and I know, like you said, man, those are you know, what you're choosing. And obviously being down there adds a whole new dynamic to to you know to racing right you can race in the united states and understand the surroundings and i mean things are a lot easier um i can only imagine you know trying to trying to set up the to race in any of the baja races and what that's like you know um uh so so your intention you're gonna race them all uh and um that's exciting obviously we're uh we're excited to watch the watch that and 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 see how see how that works out for you Um, yep I, I would, I'd be curious, uh, what, you know, if you're, if you're able, luckily enough to, to race for the next 20 years of your life, when it's all said and done, what, what would you, you know, what would you want that resume to say? <laughs> uh, definitely multi-time Baja 1000 winner. Um, yeah. you know, that, that's the granddaddy of all, all those races. Uh, I would like to get one more mint 400 win under at least one more mint 400 win under my belt so I can. I'm already kind of known as the king of the mint 400, but I just want to really put a good stamp on it. And, uh, you know, if I race for, if I race it 20 more times, I don't see one or two more wins coming my way. Yeah. Uh, the desert in Southern Nevada suits me. It suits my driving style. The race suits it. And yeah. I seem to react and perform really well under high pressure situations like that. So it, uh, you know, I see, you know, a couple of more of those coming, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I really want to be known as, you know, a good competitor to the guys that I'm racing against yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and a great athlete to the sponsors that chose to sponsor me and partner with me and, yeah. um, you know, just, and leave that legacy of when I'm gone, the sport misses me. Yeah, no doubt. No so, doubt. So could you ever see yourself or is there any chance of ever going back to NASCAR? Is that ever an option? I made <laughs> I made a little attempt at it uh, back in November. I went and ran one of the ARCA um, ARCA races at Phoenix, where I jumped back in the car and, and finished six. I've been in a car in two years, and um, you know had a lot of fun. And it uh, I don't foresee making it to the cup level, but you know doing a few races here and there for fun uh, is definitely I I foresee in my future and. Uh, I want to get into more of the Porsche cup racing, do road racing and that side of it, just, you know, simply because it's something different. It's a new challenge and, uh, something that looks like a lot of fun, but I'll definitely still be turning left in, in the near future. Nice. All right. Hello. I, I love that. Yeah. And, and I, I think of everyone that I've seen that, that does get, you know, into a desert truck or any of that stuff. I mean, they all seem to always go back and race cars some point. I mean, Robbie and I know Tony Stewart's done, you know, a lot of other things outside of the NASCAR world. Uh, it just seems like guys that like to go fast, they can't get enough of whatever that vehicle is. They, 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 uh, they can't get enough of it. Yeah, for sure. And they, you know, the one thing about stock car racing, it's very organized and it's very easy to do. Um, you know, you just show up to the track designated, you know, set time that you go in set time that you have to leave the garage and, and, uh, so it makes it very easy to do and the cars go, I mean, the cars go really fast, a half mile track, top yeah. speed, 175 miles an hour, 170 miles an hour. There's not very many places you get to do that. So no. it, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and, and it presents its own challenges and, you know, like it goes back to, it goes back to the people. And, and if you enjoy being around the people, you'll enjoy what you're doing. And, yeah. um, you know, one thing NASCAR has over a lot of sports is, you're able to employ five, six, seven people that all have the same goal every morning they wake up and it's to win that race that, you know, that weekend. So it, uh, it definitely makes it a lot of fun. And, and, uh, you know, the bonds and friendships you get are, are irreplaceable and you'll never forget yeah. them. Yep. So I, I got, I think I've got one last thing. Do you hope one day to be the father of a racer? Do you, <laughs> you know, and, and, and being able to kind of uh, share those things and, and, and all your knowledge and, and experience with, uh, with that next generation. I, I definitely do. When, uh, 
you know, we never, I never pushed racing on Liam when we were little. There's actually, if you come in our house, the only thing that even says I'm a racer is a display of helmets on the wall that actually Lisa chose to put up there. If it was me, I wouldn't even um, have them up. So then you'd have to come in the office and see my simulator to, to know I'm a racer. But <laughs> to know what's going on. Yeah. But, uh, but Liam picked up on it very, very early on in life. And I really don't see things being any different than yeah. him getting behind the wheel and, and being a race car driver of some kind. Yeah. No, and I'll say, I'll say this, man. I mean, if you for, for all your, for all your success and everything you've been able to do, you're, you're a very humble individual. Um, yeah, you, I don't think it would come off as to anyone that, that, uh, that, that this guy, you know, races, races trophy trucks. He does all these, all these crazy things, goes, uh, you know, a million miles an hour through, uh, through some really uh, sketchy spots in the desert. But, uh, yeah, I don't think anyone would ever assume that if they just met you, not knowing that you were a racer. So, um, yeah. I think you, you represent our Valley. Well, you represent, you know, the whole idea about what we're doing with, with this podcast, right. Is showing that, I mean, out of even the most random places, you know, people find, you know, you know amazing success. And, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's something that, that you definitely, uh, you know, epitomize. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. And I, and that's what I tell a lot of people. And if you look at a lot of professional race car drivers in the world, and I think a lot of professional athletes in general, they come from smaller communities and, yeah. You know, I think some of it is like, how do I, you know, how do I get out of here? Even though I never really had that intention, it was, Hey, I'm from a small community and I can, I can compete against even, you know, people that had everything. So, yeah. um, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, you know, being from a small community and that's something that I've wanted to show with my foundation and my charity work is just because, um, you know, you're from somewhere where you don't think we have equal to what a big city does. We have more because we have community, we have people behind us. And, uh, and that's what one thing I really liked about, you know, my foundation work was bringing people from other areas to show us our special Valley that we have and, and our cool group of friends and, yeah. um, and the support that we get. No doubt about it. I mean, you know, for those that, yeah, just, Justin's got a, you know, his amazing foundation that, you know, uh, has you know the, the golf tournament that you've done in the past and 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 the, the amazing turnout of that and and even you know, your your friends from from the racing world coming to support that and then the local community here is supporting it as well um probably one of the most uh, you know one, one of the f uh, most fun things that, that we've that we have here that we've had in the past so um always an enjoyable uh, time there uh but yeah it, it is really cool to see you know the way i think uh, our community supports uh, supports individuals. And I mean, I know like when you race in Vegas with the truck series, uh, you know, you got a lot of the, the, the support of the community to, yeah. to back that. And, and I know it was probably cool to have, uh, you know, a bunch of people from the Valley there, they're at that race for you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was definitely a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I wish we can carry it on some more and hopefully we can get back to the golf tournament this year. Uh, COVID's kind of messed it up last year, unfortunately. Yeah. And we I'll say that, but, um, you know, on the side of the golf tournament, when you can't have people attend, it really doesn't, it, you just really it can't have the purpose to. of it. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to do like a golden tea tournament, but you know, it's not, um, it's not what I want to represent and, and it's not something I want to fall into. So, uh, we'll get yeah. back to something here really soon and, um, you know, get back to doing what we do for the Valley and, Exactly. In the meantime, we're gonna go out and go win races and represent Brawley. Yeah, man, we're uh, we're fired up. I, I know you said you, you're getting down there to Baja uh, tomorrow, and and uh, you know we we look forward to watching the prep. Uh, definitely following the following the YouTube, following the Instagram, um, and uh, you know those are those are things that uh, that's really cool because it opens up a whole new world to a lot of people. Um, and I, so I love what you guys are doing with that because. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's such a unique experience to be able to follow along with. So fired up that you have that going. Yep. Yep. No, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, YouTube, actually all my social media stuff is real easy. It's Justin Lofton 41. Um, make it easy name, truck number, call it good. So, but we have three full years of, uh, YouTube stuff already done. And, uh, I can't even tell you how many hours of it we have up there. Uh, I was just looking at some of our social media numbers and our watch time from last year is up in the millions of hours. So that That's tells awesome. you how, how much we have uh, on there. And, uh, 
makes it a lot of fun. We got a lot of cool stuff going on this year. Um, you know, a lot more shop time. Uh, we're getting our guys that are more involved in it, uh, involved on the show, talking about it, explaining about it. And, uh, and then we have a new editor, so it's going to have a completely different look than what our previous three years uh, has. And I'm uh, looking forward to yeah. showcasing it. And actually this Friday, so what would it be? The uh, 26th at 1 p.m. Um, episode 1 for 2021 comes out. And then it's just a, a big snowball compounding after that, that every couple of weeks we'll have a new one out and uh, make it a lot of fun. And, and can't wait to see what people's reactions are to it. That's fired up. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we that we get that info out too, uh, you because know, uh, we definitely want to follow along with that. And and uh, man, we're you got two uh, you got two supporters right here. I know you have a whole bunch of them, man. We, we can't wait to watch what you do. Um, we'll uh, we'll be following along, and and definitely uh, we look forward to uh, the next time we're gonna sit down. Like we talked about, we're sitting down. We're gonna have this camera over here. We're gonna sit down here and and uh, and then ha have an even better conversation in, in person. Um, and uh, no man, we can do uh, it over some drinks. It looks like you got a nice grill back there. So yeah, man, nice we, it's uh, it's it's, it's all set up. You know, we're uh, so so we'll definitely have that. Uh, we'll we'll uh, you know maybe maybe after after one of these Baja wins that you got coming up, and we'll have to follow up with this. So uh, yeah, man. Um, excited for you and and uh, I, I you know I, th I think there's a lot of good coming this way man yep yep no I appreciate it and like what you guys are doing and look forward to following along with it appreciate it man and so your next race is the San Felipe San Felipe 250 and it's not until uh, April 17th so still got a little bit of time but um, as you showcases in my in the first episode that if trucks have already been torn down and, and getting prepped and ready and um, the whole process has started. So it's uh, it's quite, it's quite the deal. These things are amazing. It's they're over 150 man hours and just taking care of them in between races. And um, it's nuts. It's absolute yeah. nuts. Yeah. Now that's exciting, man. Um, we'll stay in touch and then uh, let you, uh, let you go finish uh, getting ready for, uh, for your trip down tomorrow. Yeah. But uh uh, we appreciate you, man, taking the time and, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, we look forward to, to some good conversations in the future. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, Justin. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you. All right, man. All right. Go get, go get those, go get those kids to sleep. Yeah, one's been smacking <laughs> with a stick for the past, like three minutes standing right here next to me. I'm just like, go, go, go away. Away. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dog had, had her Nothing head I on can my do it. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm not going to. <laughs> just gotta like ignore it yeah and, uh, that's a i have gotta become a true professional ignore my two-year-old smacking me with yeah. a stick while I'm talking. yeah all right man we'll, we'll see we'll, you uh, we'll, we'll let you go do your thing man i appreciate it thank you Justin. all right see you bye, bye